was in 1912 when a Polish book buyer named Wilfred Voynich was in Italy looking for interesting and rare books to buy. He just finished his lunch and to avoid a sudden downpour he ducked into an out of the way bookstore and started browsing its dusty shelves. And it was there that he happened across a book. This book with no title on its cover was full of hand drawn illustrations, imaginary plants, floating castles, astrological signs, and my personal favorite, women with their brassicists and pussies out. And what was even stranger about this book, that it was handwritten in a language he'd never seen before, and he figured he'd seen them all. When he asked the old man who owned the shop, the book's origins, the old man said he'd never seen it before, and he knew all his books, but this one, well, it appeared out of nowhere's. Voynich was beguiled as he slowly turned the pages to the 240 page book that looked like someone had illustrated their acid trip. Now intrigued, he had to have this book and asked the old man how much it was worth. And this old man, who probably smelt like ham, sensing that there was a profit to be made, told him that the book was priceless and he couldn't part with it at any unreasonable cost. Now angry, Voynich told the old man that he was going to send him to meet his god. Voynich then picked up an early leather-bound edition of the Bible and he started beating the old wop with it. And as the old man prayed to his god, he bled out and died. Nah, that never happened. I'm just trying to add a little drama to the tale. The old man told him to pay what he wanted for it because he believed that it was worthless. So Voynich left with his treasure, paying the equivalent of a cup of coffee. Probably Italian coffee. It was from there that the book buyer brought his find to America, where he wanted the experts to determine the origins of his strange but delightful find. But it was also there that these experts would be continually baffled for over a century. Most likely not the same experts, because those guys' original experts would have died. The book that became known as the Voynich Manuscript, after the man that brought it to the world's attention, has continued to baffle. The writings inside, with the characteristics of a real language, has never been identified, with many wondering if it's some sort of secret code or remnants of a lost race, probably Venus, because they seem to get extinct more than other races do. With tests on the book showing that it had been created around the year 1420, with three authors and a separate person drawing the illustrations, this 24 by 16 centimeter book has remained a mystery with experts disagreeing on his origins, but all of them eventually agreeing on one thing, that whoever wrote it definitely loves brassicis and pussy. And if you've got a problem with that, in my expert opinion, you're a gay. This world, there are things that go beyond our understanding. Things that our tiny minds cannot possibly comprehend. Like when does reality end and dreams begin? Between the flick of a light switch and a dream, we continually shroud ourselves in a veil of illusion. Whether we call it gut feelings, a sixth sense, or something else, we've all experienced intuition at one time or another. Of course, gut feelings are often wrong. I mean, how many times have you been on an airplane at 30,000 feet in bad turbulence and turned to the beautiful girl sitting next to you and said, we're all gonna die, give me a blowjob? Really? Nah, <laughs> okay, you're lost. But apparently, experts say that your intuitions are right a lot of the times. Psychologists note that people subconsciously pick up information all around them in this world, leading us to seemingly sense or know information without knowing exactly how we got to that conclusion. But cases of intuition are difficult to prove or study, and psychology may only be part of the answer. Case in point. Meet the Howell family. Greg and Heather were overjoyed when she became pregnant with her first child, and Elijah came into their lives. 
with their one goal to nurture and provide and give the perfect life to their new son. But it became evident very early on that he was not like other children. Because when Elijah was only 10 months old, he started to have conversations with his dead grandparents. First heard on a baby monitor, it sounded like he was on the phone to them. What made it even more bizarre, he would come back with facts that only his grandparents would know. Saying that they missed them terribly, and they wished that they could be there. But they are watching over the family. Keeping in mind that the kid was only 10 months old, it was becoming too much for the new parents. But they couldn't shut the kid up from being the messenger of the dead. And when they tried to talk to the family physician about it, he thought they were nuts. When Elijah was only a year old, Heather found out she was pregnant with a second baby. And she was overjoyed, hoping to expand their family. It was while heavily pregnant, Elijah approached his mother, put his hand on her stomach, and said to her, the baby will die. Shocked by this, the mother punished her son and sent him to his room. The next day, she miscarried. As Heather wept, Elijah came to his mother and told her not to cry because soon she would be pregnant with twins. But this was no consolation to the mother who was in mourning. But it was only 12 months later that Heather gave birth to twins. Elijah now had two baby brothers. The parents have now accepted that their son is a freak of nature and now get him to pick out lottery tickets weekly and have limited the times that he can talk to his grandparents to every Sunday. Which if you ask me, it's still too much and I'd make it Christmas and birthdays. The little fucking show off. But unfortunately, not all endings are happy endings. And this illusion that we shroud ourselves in and hold on to so tightly is only temporary at best and can be ripped away from us at any time. Case and point. Meet Ho Hung and Chin Un. Best friends who are inseparable, some may say, in life and maybe in death. Singapore is known as one of the safest places in the world, and it isn't a cliche. You'd be hard pressed to find any documented major crime in the last 50 years or so, but nothing in this world is a sure thing. Nothing. nothing. It was Wednesday, and the two best friends had been at school, and although frowned upon by the school, they left the property on their lunch to go buy some candy, and it was that sweet tooth that would cost them daily because they never returned to their school. In fact, they never returned anywhere. When the two boys were absent after lunch, the school called their parents and reported them missing. The parents were baffled. Both boys came from a good, secure, loving family and had no need to run away. But where had they gone? They'd even left their knapsacks at school. As days turned into weeks, the family-oriented country was shocked but also terrified that two of the young citizens could vanish off the streets in broad daylight. And as weeks turned into months, McDonald's offered a $100,000 reward for any information on the boys and a free cheeseburger limited to one customer. One of the most popular theories at the time was that the candy store the boys frequented was cursed as it was built on a burial spot of Singaporeans massacred by the Japanese in World War II. And as the month turned into a year, it wasn't looking good. It was on the one year anniversary of the boy's disappearance that police received a phone call from a stool pigeon with information what had happened to the two children. They'd been abducted by a child trafficking ring and brought to Thailand, where their legs and arms had been cut off along with their tongue, and they were put on the streets to beg. And although unheard of in Singapore, it wasn't altogether rare in Asia. And if you can't trust a no good gook stool pigeon, then who can you trust? It now remains Singapore's most famous unsolved mystery. And I guess the faint of heart want to stick to the cursed candy store angle. But either way, it's now a cautionary tale for any children in Singapore who want to leave the school grounds at lunch. Welcome to Solway Firth, a shit stain on the underwears of England that forms the border between England and Scotland. And I guess it's safe to say with its tacky souvenir shops, pubs serving piss warm beer, and women so fat they'd break the strongest of chairs, that it wouldn't be on anybody's list to visit. But I suppose there's always something in this world for someone. 
Or maybe I should say, someone out of this world. Case in point. Meet the Templeton family. Firefighter Jim Templeton from nearby Cumbria had just got himself a new camera and figured he'd try it out so they caught a train to Solway Firth, known for its natural beauty, among other things. Arriving into town just around lunch, the family decided to have something to eat before they set out. After a delicious lunch, a cucumber sandwiches, cups of tea, and fizzy lemonade drinks, the family set out for a nice hike. Speaking to locals, and Jim took a couple of pictures, and before dinner, they headed home. When Jim got home, keen to see how his new camera worked, he brought his pictures in to be developed. Returning a week later, Jim was met by a pale-faced photo technician who told him that the film roll must have been exposed and that only two pictures survived. When Jim saw the photo, he touched cloth. What the fuck were a spaceman doing in the shit and middle of nowhere of England? I mean, even an English person wouldn't want to go there, much less someone a million light miles away. He couldn't believe his eyes, and neither could the fucking technician. They both sat there scratching their heads thinking this is fucking fucked up. The worst part is, is that Jim swears there were no one around them for miles. And there have been theories, sure. Like they've been testing weapons a short mile away and maybe the aliens were checking things out. But theories. It's like a retard with a law degree. I mean, shit. But either way, no one to this very day has come up with a reasonable explanation of what has now become known as the Solway Spaceman. But sometimes reality and lack of reality meld and make one great big urban legend. And I guess you could say that Japan, or Japland, as I like to call her, is one of those countries that's full of lack of reality in urban legends. Case in point. There is a story in Japland where a pretty girl will approach you in the darkness. She will ask you if you think that she's pretty. Do you think I'm pretty? If you say no, she will slit your throat and kill you with a long pair of scissors. If you say yes, she will reveal her face that's been slit from ear to ear and then ask you the question again, do you think I'm pretty? If you say no, she will kill you with her scissors. If you say yes, she will slit your face ear to ear. And you see, this is where you gotta get clever with women. If it was me and a woman approached me in a dark alley and asked that, I say, honey, it's not the looks that matter, it's what you can do with that big mouth of yours. And why don't you wrap that big mouth around my big cock? And then we'll go have a couple of drinks, and if you're lucky, you can stay over at my place. <laughs> you know the score. <laughs> That bug says, why don't you buy a bottle of tequila, some Chinese food, and come on over to my place. No dudes, chicks only.